Hi, I'm Dr. Jason D. Campbell, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. Yeah, sorry about that. Actually, this is the sorcerer of mathematics, as I've apparently been branded. And this is my official contribution to the real Dr. Jason J. Campbell's uh, Nietzsche series. He put out a call for another call for contributions, and I'm responding to that. And the notes that he has provided are notes 304 to 314. As with last time, I will be using the Barnes & Noble Library edition of The Will to Power, which might be a slightly different translation than yours. I don't know what version you're using, viewer. But he gave a, a very idea-filled section of the book, so there's no way I'm going to be able to go through every single thing that's expressed here but I'm going to chop it up into bits and pieces and comment on the ideas that I think really stand out in this uh, section. And I'm going to get started quickly because there's a lot of ground to cover. This section is uh, section four of book two, chapter two, and it's called how virtue is made to dominate which already you can tell that this is going to be good and we're starting with notes 304 this note is called concerning the ideal of the moralist he starts out by saying in this treaty treatise we wish to speak of the great politics of virtue and in particular he talks about how virtue is made to dominate. Now, he talks, answers this by saying uh, that in order for it to dominate, one must renounce all hope of becoming virtuous. Now, this is key. This is the tone for the entire section. He's talking about how in order for virtue to reign free in society, you must necessarily use immoral means for this to happen. For example, coercion and violence. Not everybody is going to be virtuous, so the only way to actually approximate such a land where virtue reigns free, you have to use coercion or domination, for example, both of which are not part of virtue. So, in a sense, morality is kind of caught in a catch-22. On the one hand, you want to behave morally, but on the other hand, you want everybody to behave morally, and that's just not going to happen unless you behave immorally. And on a bit of a side note, this is why I'm one of the reasons why I'm an anarchist. You see, the state has a monopoly on the legitimate use of coercion and violence, by definition, by my definition at least. And in order to ensure the rule of law, it must do things which are against um, its laws. For example, the state uses capital punishment sometimes, which, despite the fact that in its laws it condemns murder, at least in most situations. Moving on, quote, And some of the most famous moralists have risked as much, for these indeed had already recognized and anticipated the truth. When which is to be re revealed for the first time in this treatise, which pos postulates an ideal of these politics. It describes as it ought to be. Now, no philosopher can be in any doubt as to what the type of perfection is in politics. It is, of course, Machiavellianism, end quote. Now, one thing that I want to emphasize about this particular passage is that 
it completely obliterates as if it hadn't already been obliterated since the 1950s the idea that Nietzsche had any connection himself whatsoever with National Socialism, the Nazi Party in Germany. Because this movement was very Machiavellian in nature, and yet Nietzsche is holding Machiavellianism as what happens when you get moralists in power. I mean, Hitler himself is said to have had a copy of Machiavelli's The Prince on his library. So it's pretty clear that Nazism and Machiavellianism are pretty close together. And I think that if Nietzsche had seen the rise of Nazism, he would have uh, condemned them as moralists. And for that matter, he would have condemned his sister for libel. Continuing, quote, But Machiavellianism can never be achieved by man. The most he can do is to approximate it. Even in this narrower kind of politics, in the politics of virtue, the ideal never seems to have been realized. Plato, too, only bordered upon it. Now, the fact that he's referencing Plato here is important in this context because at Nietzsche's time, pretty much the only conceivable interpretation of Plato's politics, such as the Republic, was a totalitarian state which was run by philosophers who were able to decipher what was good and impose what was good on everybody else. And yet Nietzsche is saying that even Plato only bordered upon it, only bordered upon true Machiavellianism. And because Nietzsche only could have interpreted Plato's politics as being utterly totalitarian, this is a big deal. It means that moralism in principle leads to a form of totalitarianism the likes of which we have never seen and could never possibly see. Another thing is that Nietzsche believes Plato to be the philosophical precursor of Christianity. Plato is said to have claimed that religion as metaphysics for the masses and Nietzsche seems to have seen Christianity as the fulfillment of this ditum by claiming Christianity as Platonism for the masses. So again we have the connection between moralism and Machiavellianism, totalitarianism. Now the result of this, Nietzsche says, is that quote, the moralist's duty is to be an immoralist in deeds that he must not exactly appear to be the latter is another matter. Or rather, it is not another matter. Systematic self-denial of this kind belongs to his self-imposed duties. Without it, he can never attain to his particular kind of perfection. So, we come to the climax of what Nietzsche has been building up to all along. Morality has two mutually exclusive goals. The first one is the adherence of a person to morality, but also the adherence of everyone to morality. Now, ultimately, this contradiction is resolved, according to Nietzsche, by letting morality reign supreme, again, by immoral means, but at the same time putting on the appearance of acting morally, which leads to which necessitates self-denial. The reason why this is, is that by definition, immorality is acting in accordance with one's will to power. And unfortunately, this is exactly what morality is doing. It's acting out of its own will to power when it attempts to see everybody behave morally. 
So in order to appear to behave morally, the politician must deny his own will to power. This is perfectly okay, though, because the moralist is supposed to deny his own will to power in the first place, so he sees no problem with that. Now, quote, a great moralist is, among other things, necessarily a great actor. His only danger is that his pose may unconsciously become second nature, end quote. So, in other words, moralists must be good actors in order to appear to be acting morally. And because, as Nietzsche said, there's a danger of this becoming second nature, many of them don't even realize that they're acting immorally. They're so good at rationalizing to both themselves and others their actions that they genuinely think that even when they're doing the most horrendous of things to promote their own morality, they think that they're doing it for the good of everybody. Now, Nietzsche equates the ideal of morality with, quote, a divine ideal. And as a matter of fact, they say that the moralist thus imitates a model which is no less than God himself. God, the greatest immoralist in deeds that exists, but who nevertheless understands how to remain what he is, the good God. End quote. Now, it should be mentioned here that Nietzsche was not the first person to equate God and morality. Max Stirner, who was writing before Nietzsche was even born, was the first person to compare God and morality both to being spooks, which is essentially a way of saying abstractions an individual will place a spook before himself and sacrifice everything to it. And both God and morality are examples of this. And Nietzsche is saying something similar, actually. The moralist is equated with serving the highest possible ideal, but he is really only sacrificing himself for this higher ideal. And something else that Nietzsche brings up in this passage is that God is an immoralist in deeds, he says. In other words, he's a Machiavellian. And yet, despite this, he's still considered by those who follow him to be omnibenevolent, the greatest example of good, despite his atrocities that he can be said to have committed. So that's all I've got on note 304. The next note is 305, which is a lot shorter. It's simply, quote, The dominion of virtue is not established by means of virtue itself. With virtue itself, one renounces power. One loses the will to power. And this is essentially saying that immorality, by definition, is following the will to power. And in order to act morally, or as I was saying earlier, to appear to act morally, one must publicly renounce the will to power. So that's all I've got with section 305. And I'm actually going to skip sections 306 through 308, since there's not a heck of a lot new in these passages, other than to quote the following from note 308 quote morality is just as immoral as any other thing on earth morality is in itself a form of immorality end quote so again we have this contradictory goal that moralists have it's an impossible goal you cannot simultaneously act virtuously and get someone else or anyone everyone else to act virtuously it's just not going to happen moving on note 309 quote there are some who actually go in search of what is immoral when they say this is wrong they believe it ought to be done away with or altered on the other hand I do not rest until I am quite clear concerning the immorality of any particular thing which happens to come under my notice, end quote. 
Now, my interpretation of this note is that when most people say X is immoral, they're describing a gut reaction to it, and then they're trying to justify their gut reaction after the fact. And this is actually something that's well established in psychology. For example, the trolley problem, where if you see a trolley about to run over five people, but you have a switch track where you can make the trolley only run over one person, most people would flip the switch track because you're saving five lives at the cost of one. But if you change the problem so that you're walking on a footbridge with an enormous person and you see another trolley which is going to kill five people, but if you push the big guy off of the footbridge, he will die, but you will save the five people. Most people will then say no to that. Even though it's essentially the same problem, there's a crucial difference, which is that you are being asked to use a certain person, to directly hurt a person for the purpose of saving these people. Most people have a gut reaction against that, and then what you see in these studies is that they try to retroactively justify this gut reaction. But what Nietzsche is saying is that he won't believe that something is immoral unless someone demonstrates to him that it is actually immoral. The burden of proof is on the person claiming X is immoral. And until you can actually demonstrate, unless you can provide a convincing case for the immorality of something, uh, the claim is unbelievable. Section 310 or note 310 is divided into two parts. The first one, A, is called the ways which lead to power. And he's essentially listing the ways which a person could go to power. And I'm only going to consider three of the items he lists. The first one being the presentation of the new virtue under the name of an old one. In other words, trying to make something look like it's something new. It's a new value to be added to the list, but really it's just an old one in disguise. And the one which I was hinting at earlier was the connection between God and morality. At first, we had God as the ultimate thing to value. Now, it's been replaced with morality as the ultimate thing to value. But really, morality is just the old concept of God in disguise. It's making it look like it's something different, but the reason why it's able to attain power is because it's really the same thing. The next item he lists is the awakening of interest concerning it. And he gives an example of happiness declared to be its reward and vice versa, end quote. Now, the thing which I found interesting about this is it's essentially an attack on utilitarianism, the belief that the only intrinsic good is happiness and the only intrinsic evil is suffering. And what Nietzsche is saying is that the only reason utilitarianism could gain power was because it appeals to something which already interests us, or at least appears to interest us. Nietzsche himself uh, is not fond of the idea that happiness is something that we strive for. In fact, Nietzsche explicitly denies this when he says something like, uh, Man does not strive for happiness, only the Englishman does. Uh, I, I find that incredibly funny. But Nietzsche's intent on the idea that power is what people strive for, not happiness, unless that's your way of gaining power. And the third uh, thing that he lists is 
the conversion of its adherents into fanatics by means of sacrifices and separations, end quote. So in other words, the divide and conquer strategy and the strategy of making people sacrifice things to the glory of whoever's in power is no coincidence. It's, some, it's something that's almost built into a person's method of gaining power because these are very effective ways of gaining power, divide and conquer and forcing people to sacrifice certain things. These are very effective ways of getting into power. So the fact that many, if not most, power structures have these is no coincidence. Now the second part of note 310 is just a list of things that power attained. And I'm not going to actually discuss it, but I'm going to leave them here for you to see, and you can think about your own interpretation of them. But I'm not going to get into them right here. Now, note 311, I think, is the most interesting one. It's called, By what means does a virtue attain to power? Hmm. Well, he answers this question, quote, with precisely the same means as a political party, slander, suspicion, the undermining of opposer, opposing virtues that happen to already be in power, the changing of their names, systematic persecution and scorn, in short, by acts of general immorality, end quote. Now, this time... I said politicians earlier, but this is the first time that he's explicitly attacking politicians. And political parties do exactly what Nietzsche just mentioned. Uh, mudslinging, slandering other candidates. And I think the best example of this would be the 2008 presidential election. Anybody who remembers anything about that election remembers that that was probably the time when the word socialist was used more often than any other time. And it was almost always the Republicans calling the Democrats socialists. They didn't actually back that up with anything other than an equivocation of from each according to his ability to each according to his need with spreading the wealth, but it really is nothing more than just mudslinging. And it's interesting that Nietzsche brings up the changing of their names because that's exactly what the Republican Party was trying to do uh, by branding the Democrats as socialists. In fact, they tried to pass a measure that would rebrand the Democratic Party as the Democratic Socialist Party or something like that, which I, I just think that that's adorable. Uh, how does a desire behave towards itself in order to become a virtue? A process of rechristening and systematic denial of its intention. So in other words, the reason why mudslinging appears to be not as bad as it really is is because the they're denying the obvious intentions of the people who are engaging in it. Okay, we're in the home stretch here. Note 312. Quote, the slavish attitude of mind appears as Christian obedience and wretchedness becomes humility. Now, as I mentioned in my last contribution, Nietzsche has to sneak in an attack on Christianity, whether implicit or explicit every time he can. And just like in books such as Beyond Good and Evil or The Genealogy of Morality, what we have is the Christian equivocation of weak mental qualities with the highest moral good. The Christian, according to Nietzsche, is taking the weak qualities, the slave qualities, within the Christian, 
and elevating up to the highest possible status of being what God wants for us, which is Nietzsche compares it to wretchedness becoming humility in Christianity. Note 313, quote, but he goes further. He comes to us and tells us quite openly, you disturb my morality with your disbelief, Mr. Skeptic. So long as you cannot believe in my bad reasons, that is to say, in my God, in a disciplinary beyond, in free will, etc., you put obstacles in the way of my virtue, end quote. So in other words, not believing in their religion, in free will, in God, in the immortality of the soul, which, I might add, are the three things which Kant said we can never know exists at least not by pure reason. But not, not believing in these things constitutes immorality. In fact, this goes back to the Christian idea that not non-belief is sinful. And what Nietzsche is saying is that the reason why it's sinful is because it undermines the foundations of the Christian moral code. And finally, note 314 simply reads, quote, Our most sacred convictions, those which are permanent in us concerning the highest values, are judgments emanating from our muscles, end quote. Now, I have two interpretations of this, and they're not mutually exclusive. Nietzsche could very well have been using a form of wordplay to actually be conveying both meanings in the same sentence. My first interpretation is that morality comes from us. It is a bodily thing, not a spiritual thing as many people claim it is. And this is consistent with Nietzsche's ditum in Thus Spoke Zarathustra that the overhuman is entirely body, I think he says. My second interpretation is that morality is from our muscles. It's not a thinking thing. It's just a gut reaction to something, as I was explaining earlier. And it's not something that people get by just looking at the world around them and coming to certain conclusions rationally. No, it's an emotional thing, which as a side note is actually something Nietzsche probably got from the types of like David Hume and Arthur Schopenhauer. For example, Schopenhauer once asked, if you had one person who refused to behave immorally because of some moral philosophy and another person who refused to behave immorally because I simply could not do it. Which one, in your mind, is more moral? So that's it. Uh, those are not the entire thing from notes 304 to 314, but quite a good chunk of it. And I hope that that was what you were looking for, Dr. Jason J. Campbell. And I really want to take the time here to thank you for doing this lecture series. I know it's not easy. I mean, I'm having trouble just keeping up with watching all these lecture uh, videos, much less actually taking the time to go through the notes, write uh, lecture notes, actually taking the time to record the lecture, etc. I could not do what you are doing. So thank you, Dr. Jason D. Campbell, for doing this. And I would also like to thank Secular Numinist, because if it weren't for him, I, I never would have even found this great YouTube channel. So thank you both, and have a good day, everyone.